Welcome to this introduction to Gemara presentation. So we're going to begin with the history of Gemara. So when we look, we see that in the year 2448, Hashem gave the Yidin the Torah, and then 1500 years later, this is an estimate date, 1500 years later, after the time of the Mishkan, after the time of Bayes Rishon, after the time of Bayes Sheni, in the year 3948, Rabbi Yudanasi completed and compiled the Mishnah. Now, Rabbi Yudanasi and all those in the Mishnah are called Tanoim. And then, 312 years after that, and again, this is an estimate date, Ravino and Ravashi completed the Talmud Bavli. Now, Ravino and Ravashi actually passed away earlier than the year 4260, but this is considered the end date of any changes made to the Gemara. Another thing to point out is that Ravina and Ravashi and all those in the times of the Gemara are called Amirayim. Now, if you look, you'll see in parentheses that in the year 3948, it says 188. In the year 4260, it says 500. That is the English date. So we can see over here a timeline. Just look at these three events. We'll see over here in a timeline. This timeline has a little more than that. But we can see that the terror was given. Matan terror was in the year 2448. And then as we move along, we have the time of the Mishkan, when you had the Shaftim. Then we had Bayes Rishon with Malachim and Nevi'im. Then you had Bayes Shani's time of Tanayim. But only after Bayes Shani, by 120 years, 120 years after Bayes Shani was the Mishnayis completed. And then 312 years after that is when the Gemara was completed. And the yellow line over here indicates the year zero for the English date. Let's go back to our original presentation. Okay, let's move along over here. When Hashem gave the Eden the Torah, what do, when we say Torah, what does it mean? There's one Torah, and then we have like a qualifying statement. There's Torah Shabbat Sav and Torah Shabbat Peh. So there are two parts within the Torah. Torah Shabbat Sav and Torah Shabbat Peh. Now if we go over here, we're not going to spend too much time in it. But if we go to this button over here, it shows us a little bit about Teresh Abiksav, the way it's structured. There's one Terah, five Chomashim. Within that, there are Parshias or Prakim. These are really two different routes that you could take. Either you take the Parsha route, and then there's 10, 11, or 12 Parshias in each Chomish, or you take the Prakim, and there's a lot more Prakim in each Chomish. And then within that, we're not going to look now at within every Parsha, like for example, Bracious, there are other Parshias, the Stumas and Psuchas, or you can go the root of Alias. And then within that, there are Psukim. So you have one Tera, five Chomashim, 53 Parshias. And then within that, you have the smallest section, which are the Psukim. And that's what it mentions here, that Prakim and Parshias are two different branches that can be followed in the system, but they don't work with one another. And this is found in that Prakim overlap from one Parsha into the next. So, for example, Paragvav starts in Bracious and continues in Tanayach. So it doesn't align with the Parshias. There are two different lines that you can take. Moving along... So we can see over here that there's one Taira, five Chamashim, Barisha Shemais, Vayik Rabba Midbar, and Dvarim. And then you can take each of these Chamashim, and you see that there are 53 Parshias. These are the Parshias in Barishas. These are the Parshias in Sefer Shemais. And then we have Vayikra, Bamidbar, and finally Dvarim. Now, we know that there's 53 Parshias. One of the explanations, because when you count, that seems like there are 54, is that Nitzavim and Vayelach are really one Parsha that are sometimes separated. Whereas, for example, Vayakam and Pekudai are two Parshias that are sometimes combined. So this follows the opinion that there are 53 Parshias in the Torah, and that Nitzavim and Vayelach are considered one Parsha that is sometimes divided into two Parshias. And there are a number of indications that that's actually the case that Nitzavim and Vayelach are really one parsha. You can even see it in the length, that they're both very, very short. Uh, so much more sh- short than any other short parsha is, and it makes sense that they're really one parsha, but there's other ways as well that we see this. Moving along, we mentioned before the approach of Prakim, so when it comes to Prakim, it's not 10, 11, or 12 in each sefer, but there's 50, 40, 27, 36, and 34 Prakim in each of the Svarim. So Prakim are not related in any way to Parshas, like we mentioned. Rather, each Chumash has a set of Prakim, and they may overlap from one Parsha to the next. Like we said, Parak Vav starts in Barashas and continues in Tanayach, and like we saw in the earlier slide. So, for example, you see over here, there are 50 Prakim, and Parak Vav starts in Barashas and continues in Tanayach. And then finally, just looking at a page of a Chumash, we have over here which Chumash it is, which Parsha, which Parak, which Pasuk, and then we have the page that we sometimes use to indicate where we're holding. And then we have the Chumash text, the Rashi text, and the Onkelis text. 
So with that, we completed this little section over here about Teresh of Iksav. Now we have Teresh of Malpeh. So what is Teresh of Malpeh? So let's look at that a little bit. In Teresh of Malpeh itself, the Ram- Rambam says there are five categories. We're putting it here into four. There are things that are categorized as Allah Lomesh and Messina. We'll get into each of these in a moment. Then there are things that are just defined over here as a limit of a kubal. We'll explain what that means. Then we have the Middash Atayin and the Behen. We're we'll only referring to some of them, as we'll see. And then finally, there are Xeris and Takanas. And the Rambam says five because he puts Xeris into one category and Takanas into a separate category. So what are these things? What exactly are Allah Lomesh and Messina? And these other items here that are called Teir Shabbat Peh. So, Halach al is something that Hashem taught Meshur Rebbeinu. For example, the Tefillin must be cubed. So it says in the Torah, There's also an oral command that was given to Meshur Rebbeinu. So just like when someone gives someone else a list of items to buy, for example, they'll say, buy five tomatoes, and they'll tell them verbally, make sure that they're the plum tomatoes. So all of that is part of the instructions. Some of it is written, and some of it is Baal Peh. And there are a number of explanations for why this is, that it was done in this manner. But whatever the case is, they're both things that were given from Hashem, some in writing and some orally, and it's all part of one Torah. So here's an example where there's literally no indication in Torah Shabbat for this. It's something that was said orally by Hashem. Then you have what we're calling over here a Limud Mekubal, which basically it's the same exact idea as the first one, However, over here, there's an indication or a hint or a limud that tells us that this was given over to Meshur Rabbeinu. So in other words, it's not just that Hashem said it orally, but he pointed out that you could see Priyat Hadar is a fruit that is Dar Bi'ilana Mishana Lashana, for example. We have a lot of cases where we have limudim that are brought down from Meshur Rabbeinu. So it's not called Allah Meshur Misina, the Rambam explains, simply because there is an actual limit in it as well. So it's not exclusively Allah al but it has the same exact idea as Allah al which is that it was said orally, verbally to Meshur Rabbeinu as part of the instructions that Hashem gave him, part in writing and part orally. However, the limit of has a limit in the Torah. You can learn it from Xer Shava, for example. Then we have Midrash HaTayr and Idrash HaSpehen, but before we do that, we have to point out something very important, and that is that these first two categories are teachings that Meshur Rabbeinu heard directly from Hashem and told over to Yeshua, and was passed along from generation to generation. So these are things that Meshur Rabbeinu knew them always. Unlike, as we'll see, other things that it says that Meshur Rabbeinu heard Rabbi Kiva teaching things that he never heard before, that's not in these first two categories. And these first two categories are teachings that Meshur Rabbeinu was 100% aware of. He was told them, he was given over these teachings by Hashem, orally. Now we move on to Midrash Atayr and Adrash Behen, and we're going to focus specifically on a Kav Lechemer. So for example, you can use the Kav Lechemer to learn a new halacha, that if Basabas, a person's granddaughter, is forbidden to him because of his relationship to her through the, his daughter, so certainly his daughter is forbidden to him. So we're learning an Isser through a Kav Lechemer. So this was not told to Meshur Rabbeinu. However, the tool was given for these Limudim to be brought out, and some of them Meshur Rabbeinu brought out, and some of them were only learned in later generations. Now, What's unique about these first three, as opposed to the last one, or the last two of Gzeris and Takhanis, is that these first three categories are all teachings that are min ha-teira. They're all these surim, or chiyuvim, whatever it may be, min ha-teira. Just the first two were told to Meshur Benu, and this third one is a tool that can be used to learn out things from the Teira. And then finally, we have in the last category, Gzeris and Takhanis. So for example, Bsar Eif Bechalov, that's a gzera to safeguard a yid from doing an avera. And the principle is that the kana, in order that there should be a functioning economy among the yidin, that people are not stopping to lend money. And now in this itself, there are generally two categories in this group. That, like we just mentioned, laws to safeguard the laws of the Torah. And then there are laws to deal with various issues that arise. Like, for example, the principle so that people don't stop lending one another money because they're afraid they're not going to get paid back once Shviyas arrives. Moving along, so we have over here Teresh Shabbat and Teresh Shabbat Peh. So that was all essentially given to Moshe Rabbeinu. The first two we said actually explicitly. The third one is Minat Teresh, but it's a tool. And the last one is a power that's given to Chazal to institute and establish new things. And most of them were instituted and established only at the beginning of Bayashani, which is around close to a thousand years, 800 to a thousand years after the Torah was given. Now as we move along, we have over here that Rabbi Danasi completed the Mishnah. So the Mishnah basically is this Torah Shabbat Peh. It gives all the halachas that are either Allah Allah Meshemisinai, or that are learned out, for example, from Egzei Roshava, or something that's learned out, the Midas Shatern Edrashas Behen, like a Kalvachemer, and Egzei Roshava, that accumulated 
all the way up to the time of Rabbi Yudanasi, which is, like we said, 120 years after Chorben by Yashani. Now, if we look at Tershav Alpet, just like by Tershav Iksav, we'll see a little bit about it. So we have the structure of the same pyramid. We have the Shisha Sidra Mishnah, the Shas, the Mishnayas. Within that, there are Sdorim, there are six Dharm, as we'll see. And then within that, there are Mesechtas, now, a total of 60 or 63 Mesechtas, as we'll see. And then there are Prakim within that. There are 525 Prakim. And then we have the Mishnayas, which are around 4,200, as we'll see. So let's go into a little bit more detail of here. So in the Mishnayas, we said we have Shishas, Dharam, Shas, Tars, Zrayim, Moed, Nashim, Nezikim, Kachim, Taris, the famous Rosh Tevis, Zman, Nakat. There's also another order where it's Nezim, Katan, but let's leave that for now. And so, just like before, we see over here the Shishas Dharm. So now, just to point something out over here, there are 63 Mesechtas, number one. And number two, as we'll see, the name of the Seder and the name of the Mesechta reflects the content of the Seder and Mesechta. So, for example, let's jump right into it. We have over here Zrayim. So Zrayim is about laws of the land. So we have Brachas, Peya, Tamai. These are all things related to the land. And in the Agdam of the Perish Mishnai, so the Rambam, where most of this is taken from, the Rambam actually goes into the order in great, great detail, exactly why is Brachas first, then Peya, then Demai, and so on and so forth. So we have over here 11 Mesechtas and Zrayim. Then we come to Mayad. These are laws of special days, Allahus of Yom Tevim, Shabbos, and the various Yom Tevim. And then we have Noshim, again, like the name indicates, laws related to marriage. We have over here seven Mesechtas, that's the smallest one. Then we have Nezikin, laws related to money and to courts, to Bate Dinim. Then we have Kachim, which is Allahus of Karbanis and Kashrus. And then finally, we have Tyrus. So you can see the names indicate and reflect both the Seder, Tyrus is about things of purity of Tyra, and the names, Kalim, Olis, all related to Tumma and Tyra. Now we mentioned that there are 63 Mesechtas. So if we look over here, there are 63 Mesechtas. However, it's known that it says Shishim Hema Malchus, which means that there are 60 Mesechtas. So one of the explanations is, number one, that the three Bavas are considered one Mesechta. So we just remove two, because instead of having three for Bava Kama, Bava Metzia, and Bava Basra, we have one. And in addition, I think it's Makas and Sanhedrin are considered to be one Mesechta. Moving along, there are now Prokim and Mishnayis. So there are 525 Prokim and 4,224 Mishnayis. Now, at least externally on a, on a surface level, the name of the Perak does not reflect the content of the Perak. Rather, the name of the Perak is the first word or words of the first Mishnah in that Perak. So I'll just give an example of that. If we're looking at Zrayim, so we have Mesechta, the first Mesechta is Brachas. So if we look at Brachas, so let's see what we have over here. The Perik and the number of Mishnais is Me'imasai, is the first word of the Mishnah, of that Mishnah. Hayakaira is the next one. This is each of the Prokim. So the first Perik is Me'imasai, the second one is Hayakaira, the third one is Mishimesai, and here is the number of Mishnais in each of these Prokim. So let's look a little more at these numbers over here. You can see over here the 525 program, how they are in Zerayim 75 and Mayan 88, so on and so forth. You can just see the number. Tyrus has the most with 126 program, and Nashim has the least. We also said it has the least, least uh, Mesechtas in it as well. Now, the number of Mishnais in the program. So the shortest parak, the average parak, and the longest parak. So the shortest parak is two Mishnais. However, only three program have two Mishnais, and only 12 out of 525 have three Mishnais. So that means... Most of them are four and up. Now, in terms of the longest, 23 Mishnayis and Perkei Outside of Perkei the longest is 17 Mishnayis. So if we just remove Perkei we're talking about the shortest being two and the longest being 17. But like we said, most of them are above four. And in terms of most of them being below a number, only 14 Prakim out of 525 have more than 50 Mishnayis. So it comes out that it's between four and 14 Mishnayis. And the average is about eight Mishnayis. Is actually, if you look at the different numbers, here we have 4,224 Mishnais for all the Mishnais in the Mishnah. However, there's a number that comes up as 4,192. So with that, we finish this little part of the presentation. Let's go back. So now we're talking about Teresh HaMalpeh. We're talking about the Mishnais. So from 2,448 to 3,948, which is 1,500 years, we said through the whole time of the Mishkan, by Mishkan, and by Sheni, and then another 120 years, Teresh Peh grew very large, and because of Eis Lasis Lashem, Efir Teresecho, 
which means that it was a situation where they were concerned that things would be forgotten because the Allah is that Teresh Abba was given over orally and it can only be given over orally. It cannot be written down and learned from the Ksav, from a writing. So it's said that Tanayim did write it down for themselves, but just to remember, but it wasn't used to learn from and teach from. However, they were concerned that as a result of the shikha forgetfulness that people had, Teru would chas be forgotten. So as a result of that concern, and it says in Tilum Ace Lasis Lashem He Feru Teresecha, that because of a time to do for Hashem, they put aside something in the Torah, Rebbe applied it to this and he recorded the Mishnayas. Now our Bryce is also teaching from Tanayim, but they weren't included in the Mishnayas. And that's why it's called Brisa, which means on the outside. Now, it's not shot that something's missing from the Mishnah, but rather, as is explained in another, a number of places, that actually whatever is written in the Brisa is already in the Mishnahis, but it's just not in as much detail. Just like whatever's in the Gemara is learned from the Mishnah, and whatever's in the Mishnah is learned from the Chumash, so too, whatever's in the Brisa is already in the Mishnah, just it's shorter. And that's why they weren't included in the Mishnahis, because it's already there, and the Mishnah in general is written in a very short way. And now we move on to the final part, which is in the year 4260 that Ravina and Ravashi completed the Talmud Bavli. So what exactly is Gemara? So the Rambam says that there are four parts of Gemara. First, we have to start off by saying that the Gemara is teachings on the Mishnah. And before every Gemara, you have a Mishnah. So it's all based on what we said is Teresh the four parts that are included in the Mishnah. And the Gemara does four things. Number one, the Gemara explains the Mishnah, which means two things. Number one, it tells us where are the teachings of the mission taken from? Because Rabbi Danasi doesn't tell us the source of the halacha. He just says the halacha. And that pre other is an esrig. The Gemara is going to ask, Minahan Emili, where do we know this from? Is this a halacha l'meishu misinai? Is there a limud for it? Is it a limud that's from Meishu Rabbeinu for this teaching, whatever it may be? Is it a limud that was later on? Is it a gzera? Is it a takana? What's the basis for the gzera? What's the basis for the takana? So on and so forth. Number two, it's to determine the halacha in the Mishnah. Or elsewhere. Anytime that there's an argument, the Gemara is going to seek often to determine who the halacha follows. Number three, it's to present new teachings learned from the Mishnah and Xeris and Takanas. Sometimes when we analyze and pay attention to the details of the Mishnah, we can learn new things that were not taught explicitly in the Mishnah. It also presents additional Xeris and Takanas. In the Mishnah, we only have the Xeris and Takanas that were established up to the times of Rabbi Yudanasi. However, new ones were established from that time until the time of the Gemara. Those are presented in the Gemara. And number four, related Midrashas, which the Rambam talks at great length about the unbelievable and tremendous depth the oimik that's found in Midrashim, and he talks about how people who are foolish don't recognize this and see the Midrashim as chas shalom, seeming even to be empty, when the total opposite is true, that it's known that the deepest ideas oftentimes have to be concealed and hidden, and could only be understood in a roundabout, indirect type of way. And the Rambam elaborates at great length about the unbelievable depth that's found in the Midrashim. Now let's move for a moment into this part over here, this button that speaks about explaining the Mishnah. So try to be as brief as possible. You could say that generally speaking, there are, as we can see over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tasks in the Gemara. The first task is to determine what every word in the Mishnah means. We can't analyze and discuss the Mishnah if we don't know what a word means. So the first task in any Gemara would be to determine what each and every word of the Mishnah means. Only then can we move on and discuss the teaching of the Mishnah. So if the Mishnah says, Ur la arba asr ba'itkinisa chametz la er er, the Gemara is going to ask, my Ur, what is Ur? Is it night or day? The Gemara is going to say, arba avas nizik. And before we discuss the organization of these nizik in here, it says, shur ber ma vehever, and why only these four were counted, the Gemara has to ask, my mave, what is mave? Moving along, the next task of the Gemara, and this is just conceptualizing them in this order, doesn't have to be necessarily in this order, is once we know what every word means, now we have to understand what the case is. So the next task is to determine what exactly is the case of the Mishnah. And this is actually the main part of any given Gemara, and included our Hechidami, what exactly is this case? Meisve, we have a question on it. Veraminu, we have a contradiction on it. Maskev, we, we have a logic-based question on it. Lema, is this mean to say that it's the following. So we're trying to determine what exactly is this case. The next point would be, the next task would be, the marker, the source. So once we know exactly what the case of the mission is, we know all the words, we know the case, the Gemara will inquire, what is the source or reason for the teaching of the Mishnah? Included are, Minoha Nimili, my Kra, or my Taima, where we're asking for the source and reason, or the reason for any given teaching. Then the next section is not really found very often in Gemara, much more in the Mepharshim, which is the Toichen. Often related to the source reason for the teaching, the Gemara will present and discuss what idea or concept are we learning in the Mishnah. So for example, besides the source that you use a candle to search for chametz, we have a whole limit that you use a candle, what's the reason one must use the candle to search for chametz? So we have the mucker, so we know that that's what has to be done. We have a Pasuk, but why is that what the Pasuk tells us to do? 
And for example, over there, the Gemara says, because a candle is effective for searching for chametz, unlike, for example, a torch. Moving along, the next task would be to determine who is the Tana, who is the author of this teaching. Once we know the case of the Mishnah, we know every word, we know the case, we know the source, we know what's beyond it, so then the Gemara will inquire who is the author of the teaching in the Mishnah. And here the Gemara will ask, Man Tana. Now once we did that, we know everything that there is about the Mishnah, and the Gemara will then move on to present related teachings. So, once everything in the Mishnah is fully understood, the Gemara will present related teachings that may add to our understanding of the teaching of the Mishnah, included our Tan Rabbanon, Tanya, Amr Rabbudah, Marav, whatever it may be. And then finally, we have an Ibailu. So an Ibailu says we understand everything. We know everything in the Mishnah. We presented every related teaching. Once everything in the Mishnah is fully understood and all related teachings were presented, the Gemara will inquire what is the din in a case that is a little different. And the format usually is Ibailu. They had an inquiry in this following case. That's not taught explicitly. What do we say? What's the halacha? Mi amrinu? Do we say this? Aydilmo or this? And the Gemara will often conclude after presenting two acceptable perspectives and approaches and uh, possible halachas, two possible psakim that could be over here. Take or let it stand. Both of them are are correctly presented as valid ways of looking at it, and there's no reason to determine one over the other. Sometimes the Gemara will say, Tashma, come in here, the answer to your inquiry. And now here for the final section is. These are just things that are used in Gemara Academy. We have teachings, either from Tanayim, meaning it would be a Mishnah or a Brisa, or from a Marayim, which is called a Memra. Then we have questions. We have either difficulties called a Kushya, which for, there are three within them. There's a Mesve, which is a question from a higher authority. And then there is a Raminu, which is a contradiction from another teaching of, the, of that same opinion, or two Psukim that contradict one another. And then there's a Maskif, which is a logic-based question. And then we have inquiries. So we have Kushyas and Shalas. And then in answers, we have an answer to a kushi, which is called a tirutz, or we have a response to a shayla, which is called a tshuva. And then finally, we have proofs, either to a teaching or a question or an answer. And with that, we finish this section. And we'll just go back to where we left off. And this is actually the end of the history of Gemara. We already did the tasks, and another presentation will go through the page of the Gemara.